Hello everyone and welcome back to the Glosser channel. It is now June in the year of 2020. It's been a time of upheaval for people all around the world as a result of the pandemic or plandemic as some people like to refer it, commonly known as COVID-19 or the coronavirus. One of the side effects or byproducts of the coronavirus is of course travel restrictions. I felt a need to add some additional new information to the Glosser channel on YouTube. There hasn't been anything new put out for a while and again it's the travel restrictions that are causing these delays. But even so I want to keep the momentum of the channel going. We have something in the vicinity of 8,000 subscribers, 800,000 views, and that's on YouTube alone. Once you start sharing on other platforms, social media such as Facebook, the numbers expand out greatly. We would have well over a million views now. That's really important because it's important to get this message out there. So what I'm here to talk to you about today is an interview I did with an American author by the name of Fritz Springmeier. Some of you would have heard of him. He wrote a well-known book called Bloodlines of the Illuminati. I interviewed Fritz when he was living in Portland, Oregon. I've never put that interview on YouTube, on the Glosser channel, because the interview wasn't filmed. It was only done in writing. I furnished a series of questions and Fritz gave me written responses. It's on paper. There's nothing for you to look at, even though I wish you could. I should point out that Fritz was very accommodating. The questions I asked were usually only one or two sentences long. His responses were very lengthy. I seem to recall at one point he even said to me, look, I don't want to say too much more at this point, because if I do... I simply won't have any new information for my next book because I've already furnished it all to you. Now, that was very generous of him, and I certainly appreciated the good effort he put in. What I would like to do now is read you my series of questions, and then I will also read Fritz's responses. Now, remember, his perhaps most popular book, but it's only one of many, is called Bloodlines of the Illuminati. It is often inaccurately referred to as the 13 Bloodlines of the Illuminati, but that is not the title of the book. It is simply called Bloodlines of the Illuminati. Now, my first question to Fritz was, since writing your book, Bloodlines of the Illuminati, what has changed in the world of the Illuminati elite? Fritz's response to that was, the most significant change for the Illuminati came when the previous leadership of the Illuminati passed the baton to the next generation. A secret meeting was held in Bern, Canton, at the Gestart Palace Luxury Hotel in Gestart, Switzerland, in 2009. At least I believe it was the Gestart Palace I am writing from memory. Gestart is spelt G-E-S-T-A-A-D. Gestart Palace. Fritz then went on to say, During this meeting, the top inner three families were represented at the meeting. That is, the Rothschilds from the UK, the Rockefellers in the US, and the Van Dyne family in Europe. At the event, William Cornelius Van Dyne became the new head of the Illuminati. He restructured the way the Illuminati was directed. Instead of a council of 13, he created a board of directors with seven members containing five titled directors and two advisors. Fritz then says, The numerological significance of this move reflects the new thinking. 13 is a number of occult leadership of great power associated with upheavals and new thinking, while 7 is a number of perfection. Fritz then goes on to say, in the past, the controllers have used numerology. Historically, the new USA tailored things to have 13 new states and 13 stars on its flag. Later, the Confederate States of America did the same thing. 
In both cases, the number that naturally could have been used was not 13, so the numerological manipulation is evident. Van Dyn also wanted to make the Illuminati leaner and meaner, and like an efficiency expert, he pruned out the top families that were dead weight and problems. From observing his actions, I noticed the Illuminati has trimmed back its non-European segments. He also moved to improve the membership, amputating the number of top bloodlines from 13 down to 7. As an example, the Kennedy family was considered troublemakers, greedy and undisciplined sexually, so they were dropped. In fact, if you look closely, numerous Kennedy family members have dropped out of politics as the backing of the Illuminati is completely gone. As William Van Dyne was interested in advancing Gnostic philosophy rather than Satanism with pedophilia, the worst Satanic bloodline, the Collins family, which was the top Satanic witchcraft family within the Illuminati, was removed from the top. This is ironic because the occult powers of the Collins family were why they were brought in centuries before. It probably did not help that a series of Collins family members have, with great fanfare, defected, namely Tom Collins, John Todd, Cisco Wheeler and others who are less well known. The Onassis family is another one that has been dropped. Three minor bloodlines were elevated to high status to work with the DuPont, Rockefeller, Rothschild and Van Dyne Merovingian bloodlines. At this point, my direct question about the names of the new top families has gleaned only that they are not revealable because currently their Illuminati status is still not publicly known. Judging from the Eurocentric attitude of the Illuminati leadership, it's a fairly safe assumption that they are European-based. Around the globe, one sees new arrangements. A noteworthy example is the Illuminati switched their finances over to the investment firm BlackRock, run by Larry Fink. They also created a new assassination bureau of approximately 50 assassins, which has been busy suiciding bankers. And Blackwater went through management, name and ownership changes and has become known as Academy, which is now the Illuminati's personal mercenary unit. The European Union has been maturing and its core string pullers are Illuminati. One will note a subtle shift as the European Union gains power and the United States loses power and is phased out. The G20 is an arrangement in line with that. Europe gets five votes at the G20 meeting, the United States gets one. You will note the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, is controlled by the European Illuminati. Europe continues to consolidate its political and economic power relative to the other blocks of global power. The agenda that was transferred from the old leadership to the new generation is intact, but it is being modified. The planned Third World War is on the back burner. The destruction of the American middle class has been stalled, and Van Dyne hopes to preserve as much of it as possible through the coming years of tribulation. Readers familiar with history may be aware that the Illuminati robber barons, drunk with power and monopolies, had a winner-takes-all attitude and enjoyed wiping out the middle class. Van Dyne comprehends that the middle class provides talent for the upper class and forms a backbone for society. In 2009, because I had kept myself alert to the Illuminati's activities, I felt a distinct shift when William C. Van Dyne took over. The leadership today have described the previous generation of leaders as arrogant to me. William C. Van Dyne had told me personally what he truly believes, quote, what goes around comes around, end quote, and he acts accordingly. People who have heard my talks may remember that I had begun saying that the Illuminati had shifted gears 
from fast to slow speed in accomplishing their agenda. Of course, I would further say any speed is too fast for me. What I was also seeing was the modification of their agenda, but from my vantage point, I was not able to read minds to discern the new Illuminati leadership's intentions. William Van Dyne's fresh leadership style has made him enemies of those who used to be secure within the Illuminati structure and who must now forge their own destiny without its support. So listeners and viewers, my next question to Fritz Springmeier was, Has the Illuminati been reduced to seven families, with the three major families being Van Dyne, Rockefeller and Rothschild? Fritz's response was, Yes, to the best of my knowledge, that is what happened. I base that on external things that are visible, as well as statements by the Illuminati hierarchy to me. William Van Dyne decided that my in-depth knowledge of the Illuminati and some of my other virtues like courage and integrity, could assist him in externalising the Illuminati. Early this year, both I and they were both at a place where we wanted to dialogue, and we did a lot of that. There was an exchange of information, mostly from them. They told me a variety of things that were soon to happen in the news, and they gave me all the information about the Bilderberg meeting, including guest names like David Rockefeller, who was not on the official attendee list. I am a Christian, and I often refer to scripture in my writings. Their view was that my use of the Bible discredited me. After waiting a half year for me to begin acting more professionally and quit using scripture, Apparently they decided I was not worthy to keep talking to and not worthy enough for the job of revealing them to the world. Over the years, I have noticed non-Christians never cease to advocate for their views, so why shouldn't Christians? I feel comfortable allowing people to realise that I am a follower of Christ. That is who I am, and I am not going to pretend to be something else. Viewers, my next question to Fritz Springmeier was, why was the Bush family ejected from the Illuminati? To which Fritz gave a rather interesting response. He said, The answer lies in several directions. If I were an elite, I would be embarrassed to be associated with George Bush Jr., who is an idiot. His unnecessary pretenses to be a Christian probably irritated the Illuminati no end. At this point in world affairs, one doesn't have to act like a Christian to be accepted. So part of it is most likely just an attempt to disassociate themselves with what the Bushes have done. You will notice that the European Union, which is run by the Illuminati, was not happy with Bush's 2003 invasion of Iraq. But I also think it was because the Bushes thought too much of themselves and did not know their place in the scheme of things. The Bushes were associated with Hitler's regime. Although the Illuminati put Hitler into power, they have wanted to disassociate themselves from what Hitler did. Cutting the Bush family loose will not hurt the Illuminati at all. The hierarchy wants to externalise themselves, and they don't see any benefit in being associated with the Bushes. King George I launched his war against Iraq because of his debts to the military-industrial complex, not because it was a specific item on the Illuminati agenda. The military-industrial complex made their billions from the conflict, and the global agenda was tailored to adjust for the conflict. Now, listeners and viewers, thank you for persevering through this lengthy interview of mine with Fritz Springmeier. We now get on to a topic I had actually wanted to ask Fritz about for quite some time. My question to him was, Let's now talk about the Mothers of Darkness castle in Belgium. You were not the only person to draw attention to the Mothers of Darkness castle, but were you the first? Fritz replied by saying, Yes, I was the first to publicly expose it, and the only one for years. In 1991, when I began working with four women 
who were members of the hierarchy of the Mothers of Darkness. They described their experiences. They knew approximately where it was in Belgium. I had been to Europe seven times, including the Netherlands, Germany and France. A nation like Belgium is quite small, and I knew from my experiences in Europe and from their description that the castle should be relatively easy to find. As a researcher, I knew where to find detailed military maps of the entire world. I went to the PSU library and examined detailed maps, but unfortunately there were three castles in the area. Luckily, I had a fellow researcher in the Netherlands and I sent him copies of maps and what I wanted him to find out. While I asked him to go, I was surprised when he actually went and sent me the resulting details. Two of the castles were in ruins and the third was by the little town of Muno in Belgium and was very creepy like something out of an Alfred Hitchcock movie. In 1991... I was coming out with my 800-page expose of the Illuminati entitled Be Wise as Serpents. I put details of the Mothers of Darkness castle in the book in a couple of chapters. But the Be Wise as Serpents book had so many bombshells, the information on the castle did not seem to attract people's attention. In 1995, I put pictures and information about the castle in my Bloodlines of the Illuminati book, And also that year, I showed pictures of it and talked about it in lectures to large audiences in 14 American cities. Now it had caught the public eye. During the Dutro affair, the Belgian police wanted me to provide information to them about the castle. Viewers, my next question as an extension of the previous one, I asked Fritz as follows. Others who have written about the castle include Jean Nicholas and Frederick Lavachery, who mention the castle in their book Pedophilia File, The Scandal of the Dutro Affair, which documents Marc Dutro and Michel Fourneret, named in a Belgian pedophilia and abduction scandal. Do you have a membership list of current Mothers of Darkness? Who is involved? Are rituals still performed at that castle to your knowledge? Fritz replied, After the exposure of the Dutro affair, too many people had realised the purpose and activities of the castle, therefore they stopped having Mothers of Darkness rituals there and shifted them to another site. I received this report from several sources. There are hundreds of Mothers of Darkness in a number of ranks. I don't want to say all I know in hope of retaining some new information for another book I am in the process of writing. Listeners and viewers, at this point I then asked Fritz Spingmeier if he would assist me. My question to him was, Fritz, I might make a documentary film on the Mothers of Darkness castle if I travelled to Belgium. If so, would you agree to be an advisor on the film? Fritz's one word response was, yes. After that, I moved on to another topic regarding a secret society or alleged secret society in Europe. The question I asked Fritz was, Do you have any information on Switzerland's octagon and hexagon secret societies that are said to be linked to branches of Freemasonry and Templars in Switzerland? Fritz replied by saying, No direct information and I question that such an octagon society even exists. Many numbers are said to be endowed with meanings. The Mothers of Darkness use a nine-pointed star. The eight-pointed star is called the Star of Chaos. The octagon shape, because of its eight sides, represents renewal of life. We have an octagon society here, but I have seen no proof that there is an octagon secret society in Switzerland linked to Templars. The original organisation of Templars does not exist, although there are many organisations that now use the name. As you may well know, the oldest cathedral in Europe, at Aachen, uses an octagon in its cathedral at the Palatine Chapel, which was patterned after the Basilica of San Vital in Italy. Charlemagne began the octagonal Palatine Chapel 
and it was used to coronate 30 German kings over the next 600 years. That gives evidence that the octagon was obviously believed to have special properties because these constructions use sacred geometry and enormous amounts of detailed planning. Previously, I had heard the claims of an octagon secret society in Switzerland, but I have seen no evidence of its existence. However, many people have used the octagon for the properties they believe it holds, both individuals and the government in Switzerland. My next question to Fritz was regarding his exposure of the Illuminati and any potential risks involved in such activities. My exact question was, what are the risks involved in researching and exposing the Illuminati? Do you receive threats or any form of overt or covert harassment, intimidation and surveillance? Fritz replied by saying, Basically, most of the backlash is covert. However, I did take a picture of a bullet hole through the front window. And when I get cut off repeatedly on radio shows with everyone's transmitting and computer equipment going dead at the same time, the resistance is overtly obvious. Depending on what one exposes and how one exposes it, the risks include a cruel death. I have tried to be strategic as well as have some balance in how I do things. You will notice that I did not try to grandstand on television. They are more sensitive to something like that. I and the people I have worked to free from the Illuminati have received threats, attempts on my life, constant harassment, destruction of my reputation, basically the full gamut of counterintelligence program dirty tricks, and for years I suffered round-the-clock surveillance and tag teams following my car. While none of the attempts on my life were successful, they did manage to scare people away from me, to stop employers from hiring me, and to intimidate doctors that I would visit. Perhaps the two worst things were the spreading of very cruel lies about me on the internet and sending me to prison for eight years as if I were a violent person. Viewers and listeners, I then asked Fritz a little about his working arrangements. My question was, Fritz, do you work alone or do you have a team of helpers and co-workers? Do you team up with other notable researchers to share information? Fritz replied by saying, in terms of research, I basically work alone. All the information I use, I want to personally evaluate and vet. Other people have helped me in various ways. An elderly lady babysat my infant son, freeing me to write on the computer. Other people have offered to do things like photocopy for me. Many people have travelled to my home at their own expense to tell me their stories, some from across the country or from foreign countries. The closest I came to collaboration was to work with a number of Illuminati programmed multiples. I shared information back and forth and consulted with other people in the field of working with DID, Programmed MPD Victims. DID being Dissociative Identity Disorder and MPD being Multiple Personality Disorder. From Illuminati insiders such as victims of DID mind control, I learned a lot. The information they offered me needed to be heavily filtered and so the resulting rewriting was mine. On books, the one exception was the book co-authored with Robin de Ruta, a Dutch researcher, which is available on my website and has been translated into many languages. When this book, called Worldwide Evil and Misery, The Legacy of the Thirteen Satanic Bloodlines, first came out, I was in prison. I would have been severely punished if my name were listed as a co-author, so it was not until I was out of prison that my name began to appear on the book's cover. Viewers, listeners, at this point I asked Fritz a question about some other researchers who may have been influential or high profile. I said to Fritz, 
Which other researchers have influenced you? Bill Cooper, David Icke, Jordan Maxwell, John Todd, Bill Sneblin? Fritz replied, As I have never really dealt with this type of question before, my answer will go into quite some detail. I was speaking and writing about the Illuminati, Satanism, Mormonism's ties to the occult, reptilians and the New World Order before all of those researchers you mentioned except John Todd. I have not tried to get anything from any of them except John Todd and Bill Sneblin. You have to understand how stressed I am to find the time to research all that lays before me. I understand these subjects in depth, so why would I waste valuable time watching people that know less than me on these subjects? John Todd was helpful to validate what my Illuminati sources and my research had taught me. In these kinds of mysterious subjects, validation can be helpful. I have visited with Bill Sneblin and his inside information was helpful to me. I read his books when they came out. His book on the Mormon Temple, Freemasonry and Satanism clarified some things, but mostly it was valuable as validation. I had already studied a great deal from the Tanners in Salt Lake City. You will notice that my book, Be Wise as Serpents, discusses satanic rituals and witchcraft done by the Mormon hierarchy well before Bill Sneblin went public about the topic. David Icke borrowed or plagiarised a lot of my material without asking, but he gave credit to me. I have spent time with David, and in his case I felt okay after the fact with him using my material. I wrote a book in 1993 about reptilians, but I shelved it for lack of hard evidence. David used the same kind of information two or three years later when he went public about shape-shifting reptilians, but I have also heard that he has since backed off from the idea. On my side of things, learning is a step-by-step -step process, and I could never get the solid steps in place to definitely write on the reptilian phenomena. It may be that the phenomena is a combination of fallen angels and deception. It is an important subject. David Icke was willing to go out on a limb over it. I was not, and I don't want to say much more unless I can get more solid evidence. Jordan Maxwell, whose real name is Russell Pine, has dogged me from 1990, even though he doesn't even know me or my books. Not only did I not get anything of value from him, his influence has been entirely negative, as for years he has made stories about me, which filter back to me. What Maxwell says about himself, such as how he is a follower of Helena Blavatsky and the Illuminati and Masonic Grandmaster Manly P. Hall, and many other things, should speak for themselves. Considering the many stories he has told about me, it would not be advisable for me to invest my time into following what he says. He is clearly not trustworthy. I bought Bill Cooper's book, Behold a Pale Horse. I was disappointed that Cooper ignored my vast research, which went way beyond his, and I was disappointed in his view that aliens were visiting us from other galaxies. His understanding on aliens and UFOs came in line with mine before he died, which raised his credibility in my eyes. Bill Cooper made a positive impact with the public, and over the years I have gained more appreciation of what he accomplished, but I did not work with him or borrow research from him. In fact, I was disappointed that he did not use my research, which went much further than what he knew. Now, listeners and viewers, continuing on with my questioning of Fritz regarding other researchers apart from himself, I asked him the question, do you feel any particular researchers are shills or disinformation agents? Fritz replied by saying, quote, Almost all in the public eye are controlled opposition or shills that are manipulated with bogus information. You only have to look at who finances certain ones. 
My policy is not to talk badly about others or create conflict in the Truth Awake movement. For years, I have endured Jordan Maxwell quietly. So, my answers herein are quite an exception to my normal policy of silence. I suggest that people figure out these researches for themselves. Don't listen to gossip because all of us in this field receive slander. Oftentimes a researcher himself will say outrageous things that will let you know. Now, listeners and viewers, for those of you who are already familiar with Fritz Springmeier, most of you would be aware that he is a Christian. He may not mention that so much in his speaking or writing about the Illuminati, but if you delve into other areas of his research, the fact that he is a Christian will become evident. My next question to Fritz was regarding his religious faith. And the question I asked him was, Christianity is a very general term. Do you closely identify with any specific branch or doctrine of Christianity? Now, Fritz responded by saying, I am not called to any local congregation, but see my calling to the body of Christ at large. I don't believe in denominationalism. I believe in Christ, the word of God, and the fundamentals of Christianity. I like the Anabaptist concept of not loving the world or the things of the world. I like their concept of simplicity and pacifism. I like their idea of two kingdoms at war, God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom. Anabaptist churches include groups like the Amish and the Mennonites. I attended Amish and Mennonite churches for six years in total, but I am not currently a member of either. I like the messianic concept of understanding the Torah, especially in understanding its original language and the deeper things of Yahweh. I like using the entire Bible. As there are differences between those who hold messianic views and doctrines, I can't say I endorse everything they say and do, but I can agree with those who understand what Christ was spiritually. They have restored the joy of sacred dancing, which I applaud. So there we have Fritz's views of his concept of religion and what it is and means for him. At this point, I changed the topic and wanted to speak to Fritz about the existence, alleged possible existence, of ETs, extraterrestrials. Now, my first question to him regarding ETs was, do you believe in the existence of extraterrestrials in the Pleiades? I ask this because many believe it to be so, but I personally suspect that this belief was lifted from the false doctrines of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Fritz's brief response to that was, no, I do not believe extraterrestrials are here visiting us from the Pleiades. So at that point, listeners, I expanded and asked Fritz, do you think extraterrestrials are more likely to be extra-dimensional rather than extraterrestrial entities? For example, some people who spiritually open the third eye claim to see demons and other frightening characters. Fritz again gave a very brief response there, saying... I have become 100% convinced that extraterrestrials are in fact extra-dimensional. Changing the topic again, my next question to Fritz was regarding a technology company called Lucent. I asked Fritz, do you have any information on a technology company called Lucent, allegedly an abbreviation for Lucifer Enterprises? It has a company logo that resembles a red snake swallowing its own tail, allegedly a symbol of Satanism. Fritz's response was, The information I have is mostly what is public and what Tex Mars has said. For instance, the company has not hidden its Lucifer Lucent connection. Its logo is a snake swallowing its tail, the Illuminati's Ouroboros. My research shows that AT&T and Bell Labs were dirty. 
In other words, they were run by the Illuminati and their network. Lucent was a spin-off of AT&T and Bell Labs. The head of Lucent, Henry Schacht, a graduate of Yale University, looks like your typical elite director who participates in decision-making for several elite corporations, including Chase Manhattan and the Cummins Engine Company. I quote from Wikipedia, which describes how Lucent have named their projects. Quote, This same linguistic root also gives Lucifer, the light bearer, from the word lux, or light in Latin, and fere, to bear in Latin, who is also a character in Dante's epic poem Inferno. Shortly after the Lucent renaming in 1996, the Plan 9 project released a development of their work as the Inferno Operating System, or Inferno OS, in 1997. This extended the Lucifer and Dante references as a series of punning names for the components of Inferno, namely Dis, Limbo, Sharon, and Styx. When the rights to Inferno was sold in 2000, the company Vita Nuova Holdings was formed to represent them. This continues the Dante theme, although moving away from his divine comedy to the poem La Vita Nuova. So now, listeners and viewers, I want to draw your attention to some of Fritz Springmeier's public speaking engagements over the years. In 1995, he did a very popular talk across various cities in the US. I asked him about that event. It was professionally filmed. It was recorded in a television studio with a live audience. I myself have watched it multiple times. I will include a link for you to access. But my question to Fritz about that 1995 speaking tour he did across America was, did you experience much support or success working with Stan Johnson and the Prophecy Club, do you still perform speaking engagements for them? Fritz replied, I have not had contact with Stan Johnson since my speaking tour in 1995. Likewise, I have not done any speaking engagements or radio shows for them since. The video that was made of my Prophecy Club talk in Kansas City was done professionally in a television studio with a live audience. That, bi- that video has been on YouTube and has been perhaps my most successful video. So listeners and viewers, as I said, I'll include a link for you to watch that video. It goes for about two hours. It can be viewed free of charge on YouTube. And it's very, very enlightening. My next question to Fritz was, help us to understand Gnostic dualism and its belief that, quote, your good deeds must balance with your bad deeds, end quote. What does that mean, and how does it manifest in the real world? You mentioned it in Kansas City for Stan Johnson. Fritz replied by saying, The Illuminati hierarchy has its own religion, which is Gnosticism, and a tenet of this dualistic Gnosticism is indeed to balance one's good deeds with bad. The elite at the top do not see themselves as bad people, but rather the most cultured, contributing members of society. They often have multiple personality disorder, so they can be disassociated from their own pain and the pain they cause others. Also, multiple personality disorder allows someone like George Walker Bush, King George II, to sincerely pretend he is a Christian, while simultaneously having satanic altars or personalities of the mind that are on the left-hand path. You will notice that the Illuminati kingpins and queens may have their occupation listed as philanthropist. Philanthropist means you give money away. It is an amazing occupation that while most people scratch to make ends meet, someone goes around with the occupation of giving money away. And indeed, these Illuminati hierarchy people do greater deeds of philanthropy than the rest of us. They set up foundations with their enormous wealth, and these foundations dispense funds to the right people. Granted, much of their philanthropy is self-serving, 
but even if their gifts are self-serving, the recipients are often quite appreciative. One side benefit of this, and one that they have actually acknowledged, is that it takes the benevolence work away from the churches. The Illuminati are only too pleased to have Freemasonry and their own institutions get the credit for doing good deeds rather than Christ. In this aspect, they have succeeded. Churches are ceasing to be seen as places of benevolence and good deeds. There is a statement that one's theology follows one's morality. The Illuminati do monstrous things, which is why they would have to adopt Satanism as their belief system to justify what they do. But they take it a step further. They acknowledge they sin, but then deal with it by balancing their evil with large acts of benevolence. They are convinced that doing good after bad wipes out the account against them. I then asked Fritz Springmeier a following question regarding the supposed generosity of the Illuminati. That question was, Fritz, if Illuminati-controlled corporations donate to charity or offer sponsorships to various causes or charities, what is their purpose in doing so? Fritz responded with, When Illuminati-controlled corporations give, it is again a combination of their desire to do good deeds to balance their bad deeds, as well as for self-serving benefits. Giving money to charities helps the corporation manage its reputation. A good corporate image helps the business sell its product, helps it maintain its employee morale, and may give the corporation lots of good free publicity. The corporate leaders may receive plaques and other rewards in public. The corporation may have places named after it. One way is to do donate to a popular charity, which means the amount is taken off their tax load, and it is an easy way to get good publicity and maximise the corporation's profits. Viewers, at this point, I quizzed Fritz Springmeier about a researcher by the name of John Todd, who most people, I think, will safely assume is now deceased. Some people believe John Todd may still be alive, I asked Fritz his opinion of John Todd and his research. Specifically, my question to Fritz was, Fritz, what are your memories or opinions on John Todd? Many people say he is discredited, but you have remained a supporter of his. Fritz's reply was, John Todd was a programmed multiple and a member of the Illuminati. It was tape recordings of his talks in the 1980s that convinced me that he was legitimate. He had great confusion over who his parents were. From one day to the next, his answers varied. A normal person would never have such confusion, but a multiple often does. When John Todd spoke, he would hit all the points about the Illuminati as if he knew what was going on. It took me thousands of hours to come to enough awareness to do what he did naturally. That showed me he legitimately knew his subject. The reasons Christians would discredit him were the factors that showed me he was legitimate. People just did not have a clue about the Illuminati back then. Now there is more awareness. Listeners, at this point I got to ask Fritz about the rumour that John Todd may still be alive today. Question. Fritz, what do you make of rumours that John Todd is still alive today? Do you believe this to be true? Fritz's brief response was, John Todd is dead. There is no doubt in my mind he died in prison. I then asked Fritz if he could give me some information on John Todd's link with the Illuminati. The question was, Fritz, was John Todd really a blood relative of the Collins Illuminati family? And if so, why should people believe the words of an Illuminati member? Fritz replied with the following words. John Todd was the very first person to speak about the Collins Illuminati bloodline and its history. Afterwards, many insiders spoke about it to me and about being part of it. But when he spoke about it, no one knew about it. 
At that time, only someone who was part of it could have known about it. Now, one could theorise, oh, they got that from Fritz Springmeier's book, but not way back then. John Todd came forward with information on the Illuminati when no one else had ever done so. Up until then, we had gotten glimpses of it from outsiders trying to look inside. That was what convinced me that John Todd was legitimate. He was truly giving us a glimpse of how insiders were seeing it. Of course, he was a multiple and had to deal with confusion and mind control, but considering those difficulties and the world being against him, he did a good job of exposing what he did. However, he got framed and sent to prison. They would not have bothered to frame him if he had not upset them. Some of the news about him is patently bogus, but they were on the war path. When I spoke to him on the phone, my time was spent trying to help the man, not trying to get information and research from him. I think he died without realising how much he helped get the ball rolling in uncovering the Illuminati, and his legacy continues. Listeners and viewers, at this point, I asked Fritz about his day-to-day life. My question simply was, describe a typical day in your life. Do you have a busy schedule of media engagements or radio interviews? Fritz's response was, my typical day begins like most people, getting out of bed, eating breakfast, doing household chores. From there, it goes in a separate direction. I check Facebook messages and emails and the like. Then I begin doing research. I may have to travel to a university or library to complete my research. I may be on the phone with people. I am as poor as a church mouse, like a monk with a vow of poverty, but researching, writing, exposing and giving hope is my gift and my calling. Then I will write an article to post on Facebook that will make a significant difference to the public. I have to be inspired and excited about the topic, and I have to feel that it will significantly change the world for the better by exposing evil or strengthening the good of humanity. I also throw in articles of importance on little-known but powerful health topics. If I give a spiritual message, I hope to have the Holy Spirit inspire me. Often, after I am done, I realise how much inspiration the Spirit has given to me because the message has gone beyond what I as a person could have done, and my faith is strengthened. Viewers, I then asked Fritz about his occupation, and a few more details about his day-to-day routine. Briefly, I said to him, Fritz, do you have a day job, or is research and writing your full-time occupation? Fritz's response was, Research and writing is my full-time occupation. Since 2011, when I was released from prison, I have also done odd jobs here and there, but by living simply and depending on God, I have been able to continue to fulfil my calling. Around May of 2013, I seriously injured my left knee while landscaping while it was raining. I have had a hard time staying mobile, but where there is a will, there is a way. Listeners, my next question to Fritz was his background as a researcher. Specifically, my question was, Fritz, take us back to the very beginning of your days as a researcher. What led you to uncovering the Illuminati and their manipulation of our world? It must have been difficult for you to successfully reveal secrets that the elite have attempted to suppress. Fritz responded by saying, I was able to learn about the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations, the bankers, and corruption in the churches back in the 1970s from awake family members and informed friends. I also had some high school teachers, especially my English teacher Mrs Ferrell, who saw my interest and potential and pointed me in the right direction. For instance, She noticed that I hated corruption and was a reader of Reader's Digest every month. She was the one who pointed out how Reader's Digest, which seemed so innocuous, was a controlled propaganda device for manipulating the people. Her helpful demeanour gave impetus to my search for truth. 
In 1978, I received a calling to expose the corruption in the churches and in the world. It was up to me to build upon the foundation that others had helped me obtain. Once one is pointed in the right direction, there is actually a lot that can be found just below the surface. It is like digging for gold. It is there, one just has to know how to find it and mine for it. My first seven books in a series were written in 1979 and are essentially unknown and very rare. They were directed towards apostasy in the church. I returned in 1990 with more books. I wrote a Who, What, Where, How seven book series on the Illuminati. When you write a book as an unknown entity, the world is not going to beat a path to your door to get the book. It is like pulling oneself up by the bootstraps. It took a long time for people to notice what I was doing. The advent of the internet helped tremendously. And seriously, when I put out my 1991 book, Be Wise as Serpents, I did not want to grandstand and get attention. I wanted to get the information out quietly to good people. While I did not want attention, it seemed I got more negative attention from the Illuminati and their minions than positive attention from potential readers. I had to persist and wisely play my cards, so to speak. I had to move forward in faith. Day by day, I had no assurance of anything. I had no idea I would get this far. It was like Abraham going off to a far-off country and not knowing what to expect. But I was willing to go where I think perhaps even angels might be reluctant to go. Somehow God preserved me, much to my own amazement. Many people tried to discourage me or to talk me out of what I was doing. A strange church in a city I had never visited excommunicated me. I got hate phone calls. Through it all, my love for Christ and my fellow man inspired me. Now, listeners, listeners and viewers, I now want to give you some information, responses from Fritz regarding my questions concerning his incarceration. It is a topic where there is not much information around. I don't think Fritz himself has ever publicly said much about this. Before asking him these questions, I had a nagging feeling he probably wasn't going to reply or didn't want to answer these types of questions. I was pleasantly surprised when I asked him about his time in prison. He was quite forthright and open and went into some detail about his time in prison. So the question I asked Fritz was, Fritz, please give us a rundown of your imprisonment. Apart from the official story presented by law enforcement and the authorities, what was the real story behind your incarceration? Exactly what happened and what led to your incarceration? Fritz's response was, This is a long story, and like some of the other questions I have answered, I will need to condense my response. Basically, law enforcement had been looking for some way to incarcerate me for years. That was told to my attorney by an ex-law enforcement friend. They finally succeeded in putting together something in 2003. In March 2001, law enforcement in the form of feds of several varieties and the Clackamas County SWAT team made a military-style attack on my rural property. They had snipers in the woods, helicopters and men on the ground and they looked like Nazi stormtrooper wannabes. They were on a fishing expedition hoping to find something to use against me. Their search warrant was for a marijuana growing operation which did not exist. They found nothing, but they told the press they had busted a big drug dealer. At one point in the raid, they dragged me in my underwear with my hands in handcuffs as tight as they could get them out of my garage to see my reaction to things. They held up a new box of fluorescent light bulbs they found in the corner of the two-car garage. When they held the box of two new fluorescent bulbs up, they said, Oh, grow lights. They then held up an unopened bag of lava rock for my barbecue grill 
which was clearly labelled thus on the bag. They said, Oh, hydroponic rocks for growing marijuana. Then they discovered some tomato plant food. They said, We got his food for growing marijuana. I knew they had found nothing, even though they lied to the press. I also knew that the truth did not matter to law enforcement or our justice system. They were out to get me. Amazingly, the judge in 2003 illegally found that I had a marijuana growing operation in court. Such a finding has to legally be run by a jury, but I tell you, in my case, the law broke dozens of laws to put me in prison. I appealed to the Supreme Court that the judge found me guilty without using a jury, which is illegal, but the Supreme Court was not interested in hearing my case. Of course, they did not use a jury as mandated by law because there was no evidence. In March 2002, a policeman came to my house and arrested me on aiding and abetting a bank robbery. When I went before a judge, she released me and said in court to the district attorney, quote, There is no evidence against this man. End quote. That was the most honest thing said in the whole case. The district attorney was red in the face when she said that, and he began making up lies that I was a dangerous neo-Nazi terrorist. But the judge held her ground and I was released until trial a year later. The big issue in 2003 was that they claimed I knew about a bank robbery and I had made a bomb to help in that robbery. The bomb charge got dropped, but somehow, even though they dismissed it, it resurfaced in the paperwork after they found me guilty of knowing about the bank robbery. Even their case about me knowing about a bank robbery had no evidence. They had merely bribed three criminals to testify in court. Here is how their testimony was bribed. One was given immunity from all his numerous crimes. The second was forgiven about 150 years of prison time, and the third was released from prison and forgiven three more years he had to serve. But they said nothing genuinely incriminating against me if one listened closely to what they said. Most of what they said was hearsay, which I also tried to prevent from being said in court and tried to appeal. I had numerous appeal issues, but of course none of them worked out in our broken and corrupt judicial system. Before we went to trial, the judge's son, who was close to his father, was writing yellow journalism stories about me. Talk about a conflict of interest for the judge. My attorney said he would call some of my 20 witnesses, but instead, the night before, he told them not to come to court because we had already won my case. I felt my attorney worked for the other side and only gave lip service to helping me, and when I first received my attorney from the government, I went to his office and handed him a gift copy of my book, Bloodlines of the Illuminati. When he first saw the book cover, his eyes grew big and asked, Am I written about in there? And that was my attorney. In criminal charges, there are elements of a crime which together add up to a crime. The judge will advise the jury that they have to find all those elements to find that a particular crime happened. Of course, they did not do that in my case. There are different levels to things. For instance, one set of elements is first-degree murder, another second-degree murder, and another manslaughter. In my case, the judge said the jury was to decide whether I was guilty of aiding and abetting armed bank robbery. If and only if they found me not guilty of that, could they go to the lesser level of aiding and abetting bank robbery. They found me not guilty of aiding and abetting armed bank robbery. I was not accused of being at the bank at all, only of knowing about it. But obviously working off the concept that I must be guilty of something if the government was working so hard on this, they found me guilty of aiding and abetting unarmed bank robbery. Then the judge told me that if they found me guilty of the second lesser crime, I must be guilty of the higher crime, which would carry five more years in prison. So, he told them to find me guilty of the higher one also. When the jury foreman came into the courtroom, he said, 
we find the defendant guilty of aiding and abetting unarmed bank robbery and guilty of aiding and abetting armed bank robbery. I looked puzzled as I could not have done both and I elbowed my attorney who should have been objecting. He said, this is nothing, this happens all the time and he let it pass. The judge during trial and during the immediate appeal kept saying, like some Hindu mantra, circumstantial evidence can be used to prove anything. That then became the new legal lesson from my case. I set a new legal low standard for the feds for court evidence. I have in my possession the page from the federal law book saying what legal precedents my court case set. Circumstantial evidence is akin to someone saying, I heard Santa Claus on the radio and my daughter says she saw him in the mall. Therefore, Santa Claus exists. Circumstantial evidence was not what the real court system based on law used to send people to prison for, especially for eight years, which is longer than what many people get for murder. So listeners and viewers, that was Fritz Springmeier's summary of his time in prison, which was a period of incarceration of approximately eight to nine years. Moving away from that topic, the question I asked was, do you have a personal message for your followers? We live in difficult times with a possibly troubled future. Fritz's response was, the word of God instructs us in the book of Proverbs to keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. People who have heard me speak have heard me emphasise that truth and the moral high ground is very powerful and armed with righteous truth, a few determined people can make big changes. Many of you have realised that the world system is not out to give us truth but to deceive us. Even when people realise that, because their worldview has been built by others following the system, they continue staying within their system-made box. The Illuminati purposely directs people to build worldviews that are like boxes, and then they like to operate outside of those boxes. Some people look out of their boxes and see things, but are reluctant to draw any conclusions. That is, to put all those outside pieces together to form a conclusion. So they are able to peek outside their box, but not think outside the box. We often fail to see the wide range of options available to us. If we could only see all our options, we would realise that we need not fight nor flight, but can assertively stand up for ourselves as persons of respect. We will discover that win-win answers that help everyone are there to be had. My message is for all of us. People get lazy, so they don't use or develop thinking skills. They worship the superficial. When Bill Cosby got tired of lazy thinkers who somehow expect God and Jesus to do everything for them, he said, God is tired of you. And in regards to people who drift with the popular winds of thought, he said, Are you waiting for Jesus to pull your pants up? The plain fact is that successful independent thinking takes work and responsibility for one's own thoughts. It also takes a certain self-confidence that one can succeed in getting to the bottom of things to find the truth. Those who are lazy will continue to allow the world to give them the security of slavery instead of freedom and order over messy liberty. They will sheepishly accept the approved solutions mass-produced for slaves rather than assert themselves as people of respect and dignity. The word of God tells us to hold fast to what is good. Well, what is good food for thought? Our worldviews are built by others as we grow up. If any stray information comes our way that can't be placed on our worldview structure, then we toss it aside. Our worldview, the way things make sense in the world, can actually prevent us from understanding how the world really works. People tend to remain attached to their beliefs and only notice those things that validate their views. They will grab a plausible explanation 
rather than sift through things to find the truth. But in this modern battlefield of ideas, what is good and what is bogus? Even credentialed experts disagree. We live in an information glut with a virtual tower of Babel of competing views. The power of propaganda rivals the power of drugs. The truth will set us free. Truth is not the enemy, so let us confront reality. There are real probabilities that we'd rather deny. Unpleasant probabilities such as hunger in America and starvation globally for the underclass. The global trend is already here as shanty towns spread and the elite increasingly see the underclass masses as superfluous or unnecessary people. The current Illuminati hierarchy is a softer version of what the previous generation of Illuminati leadership was like. While the new leadership that took over in 2009 are aware that the internet and other technologies mean they are not going to operate in complete dark secrecy as they did in the past, this does not mean the Illuminati agenda is not going forward. It proceeds. At the top of the list is population reduction, which they view as helping the globe. Humanity's genocide by war and sickness, both of which assist starvation, is accelerating. In regards to population reduction, here is a brief overview of some of the details on this. I don't want to scare anyone, I just want to state the facts that face us. Designer pathogens or super plagues have been created at places like Lab 257 on Plum Island, which released Lyme disease and the West Nile fever to its surrounding areas. Fort Meade and Pine Bluff in Arkansas have also designed super plagues. A series of influenza outbreaks during the 20th century began from US military bases. The first began in March 1918 at Fort Riley in Kansas and spread globally to kill 21 million people. AIDS was tailored to hit specific populations. Countries in Southern Africa have been hit hardest by AIDS and the Central African countries have also been seriously hurt. Bioweapons against humanity will continue to be used. The World Health Organization, a United Nations organization, is actually manipulated by the Illuminati. Vaccinations against such perceived threats as Ebola are more dangerous than Ebola. People may not be aware that the vaccinations are laced with other things and that the vaccinations contain live strains of the virus. In order to help the effectiveness of super plagues, people are being malnourished with junk food. Even though Americans overeat, they are in general malnourished and have weak immune systems. Dangerous toxic substances are everywhere and cancer rates have skyrocketed. Economic stress also assists the weakening of humanity to defend against these super plagues. A global water shortage is arriving. All over the globe, irrigation wells have been depleting the limited supplies of fresh groundwater. In 20 years, the groundwater on a global scale will have been used up, and crops depending on irrigation from underground water supplies will basically cease. Aquifers in some areas are already used up. Shortages of food can result in raised food prices. I could go on and list more items from the Illuminati agenda, but just the first one, that is population reduction, is enough for the listeners and viewers to chew on for the moment. One can only mentally deal with so much at a time. I have repeatedly written articles to inform people how to build up their immune systems and how to use genuine alternative remedies that have been suppressed by the Illuminati's healthcare system. Now let us turn our attention to breaking free of their agenda. The world order has created numerous systems of control, each system striving to create dependence. For example, the healthcare system I just mentioned. Those dependencies are part of the subtle slavery the world imposes. As Christ came to set the captives free, 
His word gives us numerous strategies to break those dependences, beginning with his overall advice, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. This, of course, is not suggesting that you shouldn't love your pet dog. It is referring to things in the world system, such as the attractive junk food it creates, the entertainment idols it creates, and the Masonic Lodge and other things. We have to be careful not to be unequally yoked with the world, for it will choke out any good spiritual seed planted by the Spirit in you. The whole world is under the control of the evil one, says God's word in the Bible. The world referred to is popularly called the New World Order today. That world order is the reign of the God of the world, Satan. The word of God says this world is in a process of disintegration because evil contains the seed of its own destruction, and that is a very credible assessment. While the world is attractive, it's not permanent, much like the affections of an attractive blonde who attaches herself to a lottery winner. There is no end to the positive things we can do. There are many good people who have made significant impacts. For us, it is worth meditating on what we are in God's eyes, because that is what counts. Let us remember that we were bought back with a price by God. So, we are not here to be slaves to men, but to abide in God. I enjoy what Christ said. He asked the Father to glorify him, so that he could glorify the Father. Now, listeners and viewers of the Glosser Channel, I want to thank you for persevering through that lengthy interview. I know it was a rather monstrous monologue with only one voice to listen to for the entire time. But as I stated at the very outset, that interview with Fritz Springmeier was unfortunately not filmed. There was not even a microphone or a recording device there was only written words back and forth between us. I'm in the process of trying to conduct another interview with Fritz, but he's usually very busy. I was surprised to get that far with him as far as I did get. I think he will get back to me again, but I wouldn't be surprised if it takes some time, and by some time I mean several months. Meeting him, travelling to see him and speak to him in person, which would be the ideal, is probably not going to happen at this stage in the year 2020. Uh, we may look at Skype or Zoom. My only real requirement or prerequisite in that is I'd like it to be something that is of broadcast quality. I will include some links to Fritz's other presentations, his various speeches and public speaking arrangements, engagements, and maybe some links to some of his books, of which there are quite a few. So again, I wish to thank all of the listeners and viewers at the Glosser Channel. If you've missed us, because we haven't been putting much new information or content onto the YouTube channel, the Glosser Channel, by now you're probably ready to take another break from it after this monologue. Thank you, everyone. And always remember, although you, although you may have questions, that doesn't necessarily mean we have the answers. But nevertheless, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is quite simply glosser.channel at gmail.com. Thank you, everyone.